welcome back to this part two of our journey along the Weaver navigation. Stay with us as we cruise beautiful waters, we find a sunken pirate boat and get up close but not too personal with Danny. We pass the wonderful boat lift and Tata chemical works, followed by the unnavigable Winnington flood course. It's still fairly industrial around here, but the beauty of the river will soon become apparent. We're approaching Winnington Swing Bridge with caution. It didn't actually look high enough for us to pass under, but moving across to the right of the channel and there was actually plenty of room. This was the first of several dredging works. I can't believe what a huge operation it is on the weaver. shipping containers, although sadly commercial shipping no longer runs along the river and the dredging barges are probably the largest craft you'll see. That said, they don't take any prisoners so beware, they're unlikely to slow down even going past moored craft. Finally, we're out of the industrialisation and trees, greenery and bluebells line our route. It's nesting time, so for 36 weeks the cob will spend most of his time on patrol, whilst the pen incubates their clutch. Six being the average. There are visitor moorings on Barnton Cut. I must admit, although permissible, I didn't actually spot too many places where wild mooring would really be accessible. The smell of coconut hit us as we passed this huge bank of gorse flowers. Another nesting mother, this one a great crested grebe. Yep, remember what I said about dredging barges? Saltersford Lock dead ahead, um, well actually it's not dead ahead, it's uh, just round the corner to the left. We tried to phone the, um, the locky but uh, there was no reply so it means we have to pull up on the pontoon and beat the horn. As usual there's a large lock and a smaller lock I believe we're going through the larger lock today, the uh, smaller lock has been abandoned apparently. The dredging barge that came past us this morning is just coming up through the lock, so it's obviously been down through the lock, I don't know whether it's uh, dropped off the barge at all, but um, anyway, the motorboat's still coming up. Well, the lock is just putting the barriers down to stop people wandering across the bridge, so I guess the lock is nearly ready. Uh, 
If you look at the trees to the top right of the screen, which is probably only about 300 feet away from Lock Cottage, Saltersford Tunnel on the Trent and Mersey Canal is actually passing just under those trees. Incidentally, it's always good practice to moor facing downstream on rivers. That's with the bow facing into the current. Two reasons for this. One, whilst coming into moor, you have more control over the boat and it won't run away from you when you step off. And secondly, any debris floating downstream won't get stuck in your prop whilst moored. That could well be the slowest lock in the world. I think it took us over half an hour to drop down in that lock. But very nice once you come out the other end. There are no roads here or houses, apart from a farmhouse which is about half a mile away. Absolutely fabulous. That's where the river rejoins the navigation after bypassing Salterford Locks. Paradine looks like a sister vessel of Parfield, the one we saw in the previous video. Just up there in the distance is the mooring that we had on the Trent and Mersey not so long ago. And here are some other forms of nomadic living. The river actually splits in two here and there appears to be no indication as to whether we should go left or right. Um, Perhaps it doesn't matter which way we go. We chose to go to the right, which in fact was the correct decision, as the channel to the left is just for moorings. We're on the Weaver Navigation. We've been here for a few days and it is particularly pretty. Um, it's a lovely time because spring is bursting into action. There's lots of buds. Uh, on the trees and flowers and lots of birds mating and nesting so it makes it all very exciting. There's a big variety on the landscape. We can go round a bend on the, on the river and the next thing there's uh, industry right in front of us. Go around another bend and we're back into the beautiful scenery. It's, it's very very different. One point I think I'd like to mention is um, the frequency. If you're on a river, the, the, the water points uh, don't seem as frequent. So it's not a complaint, it's just worth making a note of really if you are thinking of heading onto a river. You need to be more conscious about the water that you're using and how long it would normally last you. I think in generally on a river there's just a feeling of greater freedom. I don't know if it's just because there's a larger expanse of water but it is freeing. We thought we would um, get a river pass this year and do as many of the rivers as we can because we'd probably never do it again. But I'm starting to think now, after being on the Thames last year and on being on the Weaver now, I think this will be something we do quite frequently. It is just more freeing than ever.
Atton Swing Bridge was built in 1932, replacing a bridge further upstream. Now, Val mentioned water points, and there's one just behind the swing bridge, which we had missed. So, we swing about and pull onto the CRT services. We stayed overnight at some cracking moorings about a third of a mile beyond the bridge. The morning brought with it a mist and a lonely swan seeking a mate. And the afternoon brought the after-school rowing club, which was altogether a bit more noisy. Just around the corner is where the dredgers are unloaded, the sludge being spread over a vast area owned by the CRT adjacent to the site. The navigation once more divides, as the course of the river continues under the footbridge and then through the sluice, but we veer left to descend Dutton Locks. The sunken vessel is Chica, built in Norway in 1894. She was commandeered by the Germans in 1940, but after the war she was sold to people who were engaged in gun running and cigarette smuggling through the Straits of Gibraltar and around the coast of North Africa. In the 50s, she became part of the Liverpool fishing fleet and finally bought in 1981 to run cruises along the Weaver. In 1993, she was tied up at Dutton awaiting a refit but started to take on water and has rested here ever since. We can only imagine the people who have walked her decks. Best lucky I've ever come across by far, actually. Um, yeah, fantastic lucky. Yeah, they've got all the time in the world, uh, and time, I'm happy to tell us anecdotes that they've experienced, and it's just been a great experience. Yeah, yeah, so, um, well done, the lucky's on the river either. You're amazing. I'm just going to add something. I just have to talk about Okay, yeah. So this is nothing to do with them. Yeah. Okay, whilst I was coming to the last I realised yet again 
how lucky I am to be this wonderful lifestyle. And actually, you can do it in any way. And moving swiftly on, Dutton Lock is 225 feet long and 42 feet wide and holds nearly half a million gallons of water. Amazingly, ships from across the globe have navigated these waters, from Honduras, Singapore, Panama, Russia, the Lebanon, Liberia, the list goes on. And the largest vessel to sail the Weaver was the Dutch registered St Michael at 1,080 tonnes. That is 72 narrow boats. We pass along Pickering's Cut and the obsolete Pickering's Wharf. The Weaver was once tidal to this point, and for the next couple of miles, again there are no houses to view, no roads or railways, just undisturbed river and countryside. Wild garlic is abundant on the banks at this time of year. How beautiful is this? You know, sometimes I just can't believe how lucky I am to be living this life like this, this, this lifestyle. Just fantastic. We'll be mooring overnight at the wonderfully named Devil's Garden, just around the corner. We spent a wonderfully peaceful night at Devil's Garden and the following morning awaited the arrival of the steamship Daniel Adamson. The Danny, as she's known, is a coal-powered steam tug she was built in 1903 to tow barges and carry passengers along the Mersey. She's 173 tonnes and surprisingly she only draws 6 foot, that's about 1.3 metres. She was bought by the Manchester Ship Canal Company in 1921 and continued to work as a tug and passenger vessel along the Manchester Ship Canal. What a fantastic spot! to see her cruising by. Now if anyone is anxious about going on the Weaver because of the current, don't be. The flow is mostly very similar to that of the Llangollen Canal. The flow will, of course, become faster after a lot of heavy rain, but mostly it meanders along like an octogenarian in ankle weights. We moored overnight at the fabulous Devil's Garden. What an amazing mooring! It was absolutely beautiful one of the best moorings I've ever been on. But sadly this morning the weather is nowhere near as good. Overcast and cold. Heading up towards Sutton Swingbridge now. Yep, end of April and we've got the fire going. A bit chilly. All of a sudden the landscape has become a lot more open and flat and uh, in the distance you can kind of see the chimneys of 
Runcorn, which is a fairly industrial town uh, on the, um, well, I suppose it's on the, the Manchester Ship Canal rather than the River Mersey. But interesting how, uh, how flat it's suddenly become. Quite a change. To the left is Frodsham Cut. This was the old line of the navigation which, until 1827, fell through a shallow lock down into the village of Frodsham and then out into the Mersey. I believe there's a boat graveyard down there now. We need to be taking the right hand channel. And this branch, off to the left, is the original course of the river which falls through a weir and meets with the Frodsham Lock I just mentioned. Sutton Swing Bridge coming into view and beyond there the Weaver becomes the Western Canal and changes quite dramatically. But that's for the next episode, part three of our Weaver Cruise. Hopefully we'll see you then.